Hello, everyone. Welcome to another screening series Q&A. My name is Armando Samudio, and I am the Public Programs and Events Coordinator here at IDA. For our blind and low vision attendees, I'm going to identify myself. I have a gray shirt, a blue button-up, semi-messy hair, light skin, and a white backdrop. I want to start by thanking our media sponsors, Variety, and KCRW for sponsoring our 2022 screening series. This evening, we'll have a conversation between film critic Claudia Puig, director, producer Rory Kennedy, producer Mark Bailey, producer Dallas Rexer, and producer Sarah Bernstein, whose film The Volcano, Rescue from Fokari, world premiered at the Hamptons Film Festival and premiering on Netflix December 16th, 2022. For more information or to see more amazing films like this, please visit www.documentary.org forward slash screening dash series to help us grow by donating and or interested in joining IDA's global network of documentary professionals, please visit documentary.org forward slash membership. Now, before we get started with our Q&A, I would like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino, Tongva, and Chumash as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Andrea Lust, for ASL interpreting this discussion. And with that, I pass it to Claudia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Armando. Um, I'm Claudia Puig. I'm president of the LA Film Critics Association. I have light brown skin, brown hair. I'm in a blue room. And I am really thrilled to be welcoming uh, all our wonderful panelists today to talk about the volcano rescue from Fakari. It's, I feel this was such an important and incredibly harrowing and riveting account of a horrific event, but also the human efforts to help one another. And I have to say, I was completely caught up and I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. So thank you for, for making this wonderful film. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, Rory, I saw that the film was based on an article from Outside Magazine. Um, and I wondered what was the impetus behind you wanting to tell this particular story and what did you happen to read that story? How did it come about that you uh, got on board with this? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm Rory Kennedy and I've got blonde hair and light skin. I'm wearing a Navy jacket and a blue shirt and I've got uh, lots of books in the background and a kind of living room area with smart on the wall. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. Um, yeah. So this this project came to us through Imagine and Sarah Bernstein, who is the producer on the project, is here with us. Um, so she and Justin Wilkes brought us the project and it was brought to them through Appian Way, Leonardo DiCaprio's company, um, who had bought the rights to this story and they presented it collectively to Mark and myself um, to see if we might be interested in turning it into a documentary. So we read that article by Alex Perry, um, found it quite riveting felt that it was um, a, an important story to tell. We were, I think, both shocked that we hadn't known of this story because it was it was so significant and, um, and impacted so many people. And it was this volcano eruption off of New Zealand. Um, and it hadn't been that long ago, it was in 2019. Um, but it was, I think, during a time, it was, it was kind of during COVID, and there's a lot going on here with the Trump administration and other things going around the world. So it just, I don't think it quite got the attention that it would have had it been another time. And um, we felt that we were pulled in by the both the drama of the story, but I think more importantly, what really kind of gripped us was the heroism of the people um, and, and kind of the, the everyday people who risk their lives to save others during this, you know, extraordinary event. And 
you know, people both on the island in boats surrounding the island, and then um, helicopter pilots who flew into the island at their own risk to try to save people. Um, so it ends up being, I think, a really beautiful story in the face of just abject horror of, of this, this resilience and um, willingness of, of amongst these folks to sacrifice themselves to save others. Um, and that I think just moved us, you know, profoundly and, and we were compelled to make a film about it. Absolutely, you know, I could totally see that. The way in which you told the story, I was really taken by that because you tell it chronologically, even minute by minute, and um, it made it so powerful. There's a lot of ways you could have told the story, but the way in which you did just seems like the most impactful way. Was that something you thought of from day one that you would, or how did that come about that you chose to, to tell it as, as you did? Yeah, and um, I mean, I'll start and then let let Mark and Dallas, the writer producers, to to chime in. But we actually had a more complex um, structure when we were envisioning it, jumping back and forth in time. But we started building it with the support of our amazing editor, who I'm sorry isn't here to join us, Jawad Metney, um, chronologically. You know, just to sort of, I think kind of see how the story progressed. And then it was just so gripping, you know, actually to build it that way that we felt like this is the way the story wants to be told. Um, and, and I think we also felt like more than anything, we wanted audiences to really relate to what people went through that day. And we didn't want to overcomplicate it by, you know, creating a structure that might be interesting, but ultimately takes you out of the moment by moment experience. Um, and it it sort of naturally fell into place for us, and and we felt like it was the most um, effective way of really helping the viewer go hand in hand on this journey with with these you know folks who, who were really on the front lines of what happened. I don't know, Mark or Dallas, if you guys want to chime in. Um well I'm I'm Mark Bailey and I have light skin and brown hair that's short and sort of receding and um glasses and a bright red background um with some posters on it. Uh, I think you were pretty complete, Rory. Um, I don't know that that I have a whole lot to add. I think that um, the emphasis on really focusing, you know, choosing sort of and engaging with subjects who were there and who, um, from one perspective or another or vantage point, experienced the event, um, from the tourists who were on the island um, or the passengers who were on the boat that came back to rescue them or uh, the reporter who was on land or, 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 you know, the Coast Guard who was handling the, you know, incoming calls. It was people who really kind of lived through that day in a minute by minute way. And to let them tell it and to stay, you know, pretty close to them and not get in their way with, you know, overly complex structure or time jumps or things like that. I don't know, Dallas. If so I'm Dallas Brennan Rexer, a writer with Mark Bailey and producer with Sarah and Mark and Rory on the film. I have brown hair and freckles, and I'm sitting in a Washington, D.C. hotel room, which is not a natural environment, but where I am tonight. Um, so, I mean, I think part of our uh, realization pretty quickly into making this film was that it was our job to get out of the way of the story and really let the people who went through this experience tell it in their own words, in their own manner, in their own pacing and timing. I think for some people, those minutes felt like hours. For others, they went by in a flash. Um, so we really tried to let let the contributors to the film kind of drive the narrative. And, and our, as Rory said, our, our sort of complicated ideas of what we could do creatively and artistically didn't seem to be the most respectful. And I, we felt like letting people tell it in their own way was really the way to 
to tell the story. Well, I wanted to ask you specifically about those people. Um, it's unfathomable to try to imagine what they went through. Um, and we really seek to while watching the film because they tell it so viscerally and so effectively. Um, but I can't, I would think the process of seeking out people and getting them to agree to do this must have been rather fraught or at least difficult. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Uh, any, whoever wants to jump in. Oh, Rory, I think you're muted. Um, Dallas, do you want to jump in and then I can? Sure, sure. Uh, one of the wonderful things about this project is we had a very generous production schedule, which I think a film like this needed. We had enough time to go and talk to everybody or reach out to everybody, figure out who was comfortable at this stage in their recovery, talking about this experience. Some people were, some people weren't, um, some people needed to think on it for a while. So we had enough time to be able to do that. We went to New Zealand and spent some time in the community and and introduced ourselves and made it clear that we weren't there to just grab a quick story and run back, which I think many people in the community initially were were unclear of what our who we were and what our agenda was. And it was really comforting for them to know that we were there for a long haul. We, we were back and forth several times over the course of a year and a half of production, which was which was really important to this. And um, and we were uh, we were very forthcoming with everybody that we met of who we were. We shared our previous work. We shared our ideas for the film, but we also were very clear that we were there to tell their story and kind of give them a chance to share the experience that they lived through. And so we did a lot of listening, and and I think that paid off in the end. I was really struck by. Um... I mean, the stories were amazing and the people you spoke to spoke so honestly. And, you know, I've sort of been haunted by the stories of, of both um, Matt and Lauren and also Jesse and, and um, of course, you know, the, the pilots and the people, the, the uh, pastor who did what he could. Everybody's story was just so powerful. Um, for those who were the survivors who were so badly injured, did you have any hesitation about at the, at the towards the end is when you actually show the extent of their injuries and their burns and their scars. Um, was there any hesitation either on their part or on your part about showing that or, you know, I, I wondered how that discussion went about and Sarah, you haven't spoken. So I, if you'd like to weigh in, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I mean, I actually would really prefer, I think, Rory, Dallas, you know, Mark to talk about this specifically, but I will say that um, it was, you know, I think we were incredibly sensitive about that and wanting to make sure that, um, you know, as everyone has said, that the stories, are, you know, that you're hearing in this film are really coming from the survivors themselves, all of whom went through something so incredibly tragic unimaginable, I think, for most people. Um, and I think that it's, um, at least for me, you know, the creative choice, I think, of, of really kind of waiting until you've really experienced what they've experienced to, to really kind of see the physical um, effects and, you know, the lifelong, like, injuries and effects that our survivors are really going to have to live with. I think in what they've sustained and hearing about the surgeries they've went through, I think to wait until the end to really kind of share that aspect of the story was um, really important, I think, because at that point you're, you know, as, a, as an audience member, as someone who's so deeply invested in the story, I think you really um, beyond sort of sympathize and empathize as best as you can with that experience. Um, so, but I would, I would really, you know, obviously prefer for Rory to kind of address that. But for me, it was incredibly powerful, I think, to wait until sort of the end of the film to really bear that kind of witness. Yeah, we got to know who everybody was. We cared about them too. And then to see that, I think it was so much, it was exactly as powerful as it needed to be. It was really moving. Well, Sarah, I think you answered it. I think you answered it beautifully. I think that, um, you know, 
the reality of what th these folks have gone through is with, um, with the surviving a volcano eruption. Um, the, the, there's the horror of the moment of that and then the immediate aftermath, um, which is just incredibly harrowing and painful and, and the journey back to land, which was about an hour, hour and a half boat ride um, in the open ocean with salt water coming on your wounds. It's just very hard to even imagine or fathom what they went through. But the reality is, is that even after they've endured all of that, they do have to continue to live with not just the scars of, you know, what they have been through, um, but uh, ongoing operations, you know, many of them are still having operations right now, you know, we're on operation 25, 26, 27, right? So it's, um, it's not for them a story that ends after the few minutes that of the eruption or even the journey home, it is um, ongoing today. So I think in our effort to sort of capture as much as we can in a documentary, which is always limited, but I think is is one of the most powerful mediums we have in a situation like this to help people really understand and relate that that, that is part of their journey and that is part of their reality that was important to convey. I noticed that in each of, in, well, in, in several of the cases, what really sort of sustained each of them was having some at least one person there that was really in their corner and supportive for Jesse who lost his whole family, his immediate nuclear family, he had his grandfather who offered that support for um, Matt and Lauren, of course, they had each other and it could have driven a wedge between them, but it brought them closer. And for Kelsey, she said she had the support of a close knit community. Um, it really struck me how much each you know, they like if somebody had been alone and been traveling alone, how different that might have been. Um, what did you all take away from that in terms of I mean, it was so inspiring about what people will do for one another and the risks that they'll take. And then there was also the other side of maybe, you know, officials not making the right decision, too. So there was a lot to take away from there. But, you know, what was what are the takeaways that you would like us to have and what are your takeaways? Mark, do you want to jump in there? Um, sure. Uh, you know, I I think that at the end, Mark Inman, who lost his brother Hayden, kind of um, brings it around nicely, which is, you know, sort of this innate humanity and kind of a shared connectedness that we all have that is, you know, feel somehow... Um, beyond thinking, you know, you have these characters like Brian DePaul, who's in the water, and he's choosing whether he's going to go back to the boat and save himself, or he's going to go to the pier and help, you know, these, these victims or survivors, and, and he chooses to go to the pier, or the pastor that you were talking about, Jeff Hopkins, you know, talking about when their boat comes back, you know, realizing that they have to do everything they possibly can and and in going up to the crew and saying hey i'm trained and 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 as a paramedic and i can and so i don't know in that way it's very affirming that you think that you have nature out there that is you know brutal and indifferent or can be brutal and is always indifferent and not you know and, and beyond our control and up against that or in the face of that we have each other and you know seeing that happen for folks and then be carried through by that connectedness um i think we at least hope is is ultimately affirming and 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 maybe inspiring on some level okay. I, I i was moved by what the um maori chief said about the people who died there being guardians of the island forevermore i thought that was really beautiful and yet is it uh Tiffany's grandmother who understandably you know, couldn't stand to look through her window and see the island. Um, and she said, the less I see of it, the better. Was there kind of a, a feeling among the Maori people in general about this event, like something about man's meddling with nature or was it very much an individual thing, do you think? 
Well, I think it, it, you know, like all communities, it's, it's not singular. Um, and so I think that depending on what your perspective is and where you're coming from and the experience of it, people have different interpretations of what happened. Um, you know, Tiffany's grandmother was obviously uh, had a very personal experience. And I think, um, and you know, it's not just the Maoris, it's really the range of reactions that I think we capture at the end of the film of, of everybody who had gone through this. And you know, some people who have been through the worst of it say, you know, I'm not gonna change the way I live and I don't blame anybody for this. And other people say, I'm never going to that island again and I'm, I don't even wanna look at it and it should be shut down. They should never have let people on the island. So, you know, it, it's a range and people come at it from, from different experiences and have different conclusions. And I think it was important for us to not try to simplify it, to just say, this is, you know, this is the lesson that we should all take away from this experience. Um, because, you know, as in so many things in life, it's complicated, it's nuanced, it's different for, for each individual. Um, so we tried to reflect that in, in the words at the end of the film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're, so you used incorporated people's cell phone footage, uh, camera footage and audio, um, which made it all the more powerful, but I wondered how challenging it was gathering that all up and then finding a way to blend it with the aerial cinematography and all of your other amazing cinematography. So it's kind of a more technical question, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, it was, I mean, a lot of the footage that you see in the film is is from iPhones, right? From people who were there and really capture the moment. And I think that is is enormously powerful. I mean, when I saw that footage, even when it was fully raw or heard the audio, I was like, you know, s stopped in my tracks. I mean, it was it was very um, powerful and really helped you understand the gravity of the situation and really take you onto this island, right? So it was important for us to lean into that as much as possible. And I think we also felt like it was the best way to, again, transport audiences who might be watching this all over the, some parts of the world, right, to this moment in 2019. Um, but the reality was we we didn't have coverage of the entirety of these events and so we supplemented it with um some footage aerial footage archival footage of the island to help people be oriented and then um we did these impressionistic recreations um is that we we leaned into the real footage as much as possible, but also supplemented it with what I would call impressionistic recreations that were very much stylized, but at the same time kind of grounded enough in the real that uh, the hope was that it would help bring you to the moment and help you relate and understand what was going on. Um, How do you collect all that? Though I'm thinking, do you put out a you know some kind of a, a I don't know, some an ad saying, you know, whoever has good footage from this or how do you actually get that cell phone footage other than the people that you, you know, you knew you were working with? Yeah, Dallas or Sarah. Yeah. I, I can jump in a little bit on that. I mean, obviously there were only 47 people on the island at the time or perhaps not only, but there were 47 people. We know who they were and and we went through the process of trying to understand you know, which which people among them were willing to revisit these memories and talk and reach out to many, many more people than are in the film. And a lot of them were comfortable sharing their archives or their memories or their photos or audio recordings, but didn't feel comfortable giving an interview, some the other way around, some didn't have recordings. What was interesting is uh, there was one woman in particular who had been taking a photograph at the time of the eruption and then stuck her phone in her pocket and it kept recording, or she was taking a video actually, and stuck her phone in her pocket and recorded for 17 minutes straight. 
wow. which was about the time of the entire rescue process. And then she didn't know what to do with it and didn't really want to revisit those memories, but gave it to us to with with the trust that we would use that both as a guiding principle for what the actual experience was like for those who were there. Wow, so she hadn't um, even heard it or yeah, seen. Yeah, wow. I, think, I think it's not a memory that she was ready to go back to, but um, but it was incredibly, uh, I mean, it was devastating obviously, but it was also incredibly important for us to listen to that and really take a moment to walk through every single second of what that experience sounded like. I mean, for the most part, it was in her pocket. So you weren't seeing anything, but you could you could put the pieces together. And then we felt very honored that she trusted us with this material and, and we reached out to her sense and she feels very happy about how it all came together. So it was a, it was a very complete story, but like any documentary, I mean, it's, it's weeks, years of reaching out to people and talking to people and figuring out who, who is willing to share what they have. And luckily there was a lot of material out there. I was surprised. I mean, I don't know exactly how phones work in that respect, but I was surprised they hadn't melted or, or somehow been affected because sometimes you, if you're just out in the sun with your phone, it gets over, it overheats. So I was, uh, the, the technology aspects were, I mean, we don't know what it, yeah, most of us yeah. don't know what it's like. What Matt Yuri's phone um, was interesting because he, he took a lot of photos while he was there with his fiance or his new wife and then um, managed to bring the phone back and could use it, used it to call his mother, but then it's it malfunctioned and stopped working. And so we, we actually, he sent it to us and we brought it to a series of different like sort of tech gurus who were thinking that they could retrieve all the data that was in it. And uh, we went to Google, we went to Mac, we went to all of the, the people who know how to do those things and actually none of them could retrieve it because wow. I think it had like sort of fused after the fact with all the chemicals in the air, which was, a, which was a good indication of what everybody was breathing and living through that if it did that to a phone, we can only imagine what it did to everybody's lungs. I, I kept thinking as I was watching, you know, and, and as I said, I think the, these, the people that you covered have stayed in my mind. I keep thinking, you know, you, you wonder what you would do in a situation like that. Have they seen the film and how, how have they reacted if they have? Yeah, so we, um, you know, it's coming out on Netflix and it premiered a couple weeks ago at the Hamptons Film Festival. Um, and we felt that it was important for the, the families and the participants, the people who were in the film to have an opportunity to see it before the general public was exposed to it. So we reached out to everybody who was in the film and um, asked if, you know, who might be interested in watching it and let them know, of course, about the upcoming screenings. Um, most of the people responded that they wanted to see it before others. And so we sent them links to the film. Um, and I am happy to report that, that everybody's had a very positive response to the film and really felt that it captured their experiences in a very accurate way. So that's always um, super important to us. And and um, and the, the response has been, you know, I think obviously for many of them, it's very difficult to watch. And we made it clear that none of them had to watch it because we, we imagine that it, can be its own form of trauma to relive these things. Yeah, tra re-traumatize. Yeah. yeah, and we also, with the support of Netflix, offered you know some therapeutic support for anybody who watched it. Um, and uh, but you know there, I mean they're they're a brave bunch, and um, and and I'm anyway very pleased that people responded so so positively. Yeah. What in in the making of all this? I mean, this is on a distant island. Um, you mentioned, you know, you had the luxury of a year and a half time. You could go back and forth. But what did you find were the biggest hurdles and challenges in in the making of this? Well, COVID didn't help. <laughs> yeah, COVID right. in New Zealand was difficult because New Zealand really shut down. Oh right, yeah, yeah. So it was down. it was um, a, a four, fourteen day quarantine period. 
um, in the in the early days. So uh, where you had to be in a hotel and Dallas, um, Dallas was really <laughs> extraordinary and and um, made a number of visits to New Zealand and and then I joined her as well. But it was it was difficult those that in those first few months. And then, you know, I think the biggest thing is that this is just, you know, it's a very traumatic experience that people have gone through, right? And I think um, Oh, I think you froze again. Um, hear us. All right. Well, you know, I would say in Dallas, you probably can chime in that, you know, one of I don't know if it was would be a challenge, but it is a kind of hyper awareness and a sensitivity that you're coming from another country very, very far away and you're going into what is a small community that's quite tight knit with an event that was enormously traumatic, but also transformative for that community even going forward and that you have to navigate that and be responsible for the telling of that story to the broader world. And um, Dallas, maybe you want to talk a bit about, you know, navigating that. Or... Yeah, definitely. I, I also think, Sarah, you should jump in, too, because yeah, it's part of Imagine has a has a great track record with building trust and relationships with its subjects. But certainly the history of the documentary that you did previously about the fires in Northern California, what Rebuilding Paradise was the film was a was a bit of an inspiration of how do you tackle a subject with so much trauma and so much PTSD and and do it in a way that dignifies everybody and doesn't re-traumatize people but finds the higher the higher ground and the higher message. So Sarah, I don't know if you Yeah, know. no, thank you. And and by the way, I have curly blonde hair. Forgive me for not <laughs> introducing myself <laughs> the first time I talked. Um I um yeah I mean I think what Dallas said is correct but also I I really have to say it's you know when you when you start to think about a project and and Appian Way did come to us with this article and I have a six year old right here which is why <laughs> oh, no, that's okay we were family friendly <laughs> this article and and we started reading it Justin Wilkes my partner and Imagine Docs and I we um you know we it's you have to think who is the right director for this project, right? And who is going to treat the subjects um, sensitively and tackle the project from, you know, just all sorts of um, directions, but who can who can really understand just the, the amount of tragedy here? Because yes, it's a riveting rescue story, but it's, please, mommy's on, Callan, stop, please. I'm sorry. It's it's a riveting rescue story, but it's really a deep, deep tragedy. And you know, Rory Kennedy and Mark Bailey, who you know we've had just the the great pleasure of partnering with before on our downfall, the case against Boeing project, most recently, and I've worked with with them over the years um, in my previous life, but. Rory was the the only director really to come to mind for this project. I just think her her level of sensitivity and understanding of the human condition is is just beyond compare. So I do want to say that. Um, and I think, as Dallas said, I think it's it's always it's always a journey and it's always um, a sensitive project with with most documentaries, I would say. Thank I, you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, um, interruptions. No, oh, no, no, that's okay. That's life, right? It's that's, late here <laughs> <in the morning. laughs> that's one of the things I love about Zoom actually is sort of the, the realness of it all. Um, so this is our last question because we are running uh, low on time here, but I, I did wonder how this impacted you, the four of you in terms of did it change how you feel about risk or how you feel about nature or how you feel about human nature? You know, how, what did you walk away feeling? And I'll start with you, Dallas. Sure, that's a great question. Um, interesting. I, uh, I think, I mean, we tried really hard not to judge anybody or anybody's opinion. So I tried not to do a lot of analysis about what would I have done or would I have done something differently? I think I tried to 
park that somewhere else and just listen to what people did and take that as I've never lived through anything like this and hopefully I never will. But um, you know, whatever people needed to do, they did. And that that's their reality and that's their truth. And we want to honor that. Um that said, my own personal life, I've been to many volcanoes um and done kind of relatively exciting and perhaps slightly dangerous things at times and to me that's part of um, being alive and and exploring the world so i'm not risk averse in my life um and i think those of us in documentary are not risk averse because it tends to be it goes with part of what we do but um but i think that there was something really profound about the honesty that everybody had about the human condition when they were in this moment where there isn't time to think about what should I do or how will this look or what will I think about this you just have to act instantly and there's it's so revealing in a fascinating way of the things that people think to do I mean the brilliance of Brian DePa to jump into the ocean and like he had a split second to make that choice and he did and it made all the difference and you know and all of the choices that people made along the line were were all very revealing and profound and I, I hope that I would do some of the wonderful things that some of our characters did yeah absolutely how about you mark um uh it is a good question um you know I guess I would say that in each of the characters you know the survivors and also the rescuers if you're going to kind of put them in two groups, um, although some of them are sort of, you know, there's a quality of resilience. Like there's a moment where, you know, Jesse decides he's going to stand up from that rock and he's going to put one foot in front of the other and he's going to somehow say goodbye to his parents, you know, and um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's Kelsey standing up after as the ash cloud is clearing and seeing that this is the moment and saying to everybody you know go to the pier and with matt and lauren i mean and i think that quality like matt and lauren with each other in the way they you know matt said we didn't know if this was a pre-eruption to the main eruption and i just knew i was going to get off that island and he was going to take her with him and so, you know, there's this resilience in the moment and then afterwards figuring out, as Rory was saying earlier, how you live with this and how you incorporate this experience and all it's left you with into a life going forward. And it's kind of, you know, it's just amazing. And so, you know, you kind of get to spend time with these amazing people who have in this moment found this inside of themselves. And, um, you know, that's kind of an awesome thing, I guess. So... I don't know if there's a lesson in there, except that I, you know, that people have that in them and that you hope that, you know, um, you hope you won't get tested in that way, but you, you know, hope that you'll find it in yourself. Right. Sarah, you're nodding. No, I mean, I'm just in awe. I watched this film and, you know, from the beginning, even just reading the article, I was just in awe of the incredible courage that all of these people had to face that day and and really the the will to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, when I think about Jesse, I think about all of them, but, you know, we, we've talked about Jesse and I think just his tremendous will to to wake up for the next day. I mean, I think for me, I just I'll forever be inspired by that. And I hope that, you know, that viewers when they see this will will walk away with that because i think it's it's hard for people to wake up some days but i think when you see a story like this you really understand i think what courage is all about yeah and rory what uh has it changed anything or intensified anything for you having gone through this experience you know i think that um I mean, listen, this is not a film about climate change and the volcano is not the result of climate change, but you're seeing a lot of climate events around the world and in our country right now. Um, and we live through the Woolsey fires here and had to evacuate and had to move out of our house for six months. And, you know, what was evident in that experience was that 
the government didn't really show up here. Like the there weren't many fire trucks and there there wasn't really much support. And we all had to rely on each other um, to to kind of get through it, right? And and I guess to me in this experience and this story, there's something really affirming about it. Um, and about, you know, in the world that feels so unsettled right now, and there's there just feels like there's so much chaos, that there are these good people. And, you know, there are often people you don't even know, and they're sometimes your neighbors, and sometimes, you know, somebody that you just are thrust into a circumstance with, um, who do the right thing and who look out for you. And there's something beautiful about it and profound about it so i would say for me it's it's it has ultimately been a very um a, it, it it's changed me in a a a, 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 fur, a feeling that there are good people out there who do good things and and um look out for each other yeah well, on, on that note, I think that's a perfect note for us to conclude on. Thank you so much, Rory Kennedy, Sarah Bernstein, Dallas Rexer, and Mark Bailey. And um, be sure, those of you in the audience, to tell people to watch us on Netflix and spread the word. Thanks, Thank Claudia. You. My Claudia. pleasure. Thanks, guys. It's my pleasure. See you.